uh, good evening everyone so uh, i'm going to take uh, two of your modules for the revision uh, the first module is uh, uh, the third third module of your uh, paper of social transformation which talks about law and uh, women and uh, the second part of it talks about the law and children and one more uh, module that i'm going to take uh, for tomorrow's session is modernization and the law uh, that is your fourth model of the syllabus okay so uh, to have better connectivity uh, i think i uh, i stop the video if in between uh, you think that uh, the connectivity is not there or i'm not audible uh, you can just text me in the chat window so that uh, i can uh, get it through and get it done uh, whenever it's possible okay uh, so let us try to discuss about uh, the uh, women in law specifically uh, in context with the social transformation. We know what do you mean by social transformation. We uh, we also know that it is a transformation which is a lengthier process than anything. And so that's why uh, we use the word transformation instead of any other uh, similar words. And so when we have such kind of approach in any uh, logical development, legal development, and social economic development, then we have to see the context of globalization, uh, industrialization uh, at, at that point of time. Okay. Now, whenever we talk about any of uh, these uh, groups, so we women and child, basically we call it as a vulnerable group. Why we call it as a vulnerable group? Basically to understand that uh, these are the people who are not able to raise their voice and basically they're more susceptible to, uh, susceptible to uh, uh, physical and mental, uh, we can say things are, uh, we can say, uh, when, when you, when you do any particular uh, thing on them, uh, no, they, they, they cannot raise their voice whenever the rights gets violated. And so that's why in that context, we call them as a vulnerable. Now in context with the women, we know that almost more than 50% population of the whole world, it is. Uh, it is of the woman, okay, and so still we have to consider women as the vulnerable group uh, because again there are a number of reasons. Now, whatever that social transformation takes place in context with the uh, women's rights or the uh, development of women empowerment, at the same point at an international platform, you must know that what is also going on in a uh, transformative mode. When we talk about the climate change, when we have the climate change, at the same time, we also have the climate change and the violation of the women's rights. Why it is so? Because at every point of time, when it took the human rights, when we focus on the human rights, as in context with the, as in context with the, uh, the developments that is carrying on, that has been there in the society, no. Uh, we have the, we have this particular concern. Now let us try to understand uh, this particular context in a uh, in number of ways. The very first thing that I wish to talk about is uh, 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 is, uh, is nothing but it is uh, the domestic violence. Okay. Now when we have uh, the violence against the women, uh, we know that generally uh, we say that it is because of the patriarchal society that we have uh, these kind of the thing. Uh, when we read the reports given by the Law Commission on the Rights of Women, uh, we come to know that uh, it is just not the system which is at fault, but you no, know, we have number of things that are, uh, you know, that are that are responsible uh, when we talk about the uh, about the violence against the women. So, whatever may be the uh, the class of the family, uh, maybe the rich or maybe any class of the family you can find in irrespective of that class uh, the domestic violence okay so you are all the uh, students who are pursuing the masters and so uh, there's no need to talk about uh, no uh, you, you already have you are you already are experiencing in the courts that how the domestic violence will taken place irrespective of anything okay and so uh, instead of giving we can say uh, uh, the pro the protective shade uh, by being a, a sanctuary to the uh, tranquility and the harmony, a family has become in many situations the breeding grounds of the violence against the women. Okay, 
and so that's why we need to understand the status of women from that angle now when we have uh, you know when we when we talk about uh, the women we know that uh, a certain point of time that we already have uh, come up uh, saying that uh, the women uh, were you know denied their basic rights at certain point of time and then again there's a revival uh, then the status you know status of women slightly get uh, you know uh, up to the mark to some extent uh, during a medieval period then again uh, it started <clears throat> uh, you know going down uh, when we talk about the modern period and so when we have these kind of the um, phases of the uh, the history or the phases of the legal development we find that at every point of time the rights of women gets uh, gets violated and then we have uh, the law as a tool to, uh, to to protect the rights to promote the right uh, to you know to make the provisions the legal provisions in the law and so that's why you must have studied law as a tool uh, for the social change and that social change was carried out uh, with the help of uh, these particular elements now when we talk about uh, uh, the domestic violence and the status of women we also have to go back to the history understanding the ancient philosophy uh, specifically again in the family laws you must have talked about the uh, various mythies uh, the manusmriti the yajnavalkya smriti and you also know that you know, at that point of time also some of the rights of women were recognized okay but when we you know uh, when we uh, start having more civilization and uh, when the concept of uh, globalization modernization came into being uh, the rights uh, of the women uh, no the increase uh, in the violation against the women uh, we can see it in the history and so that's why uh, accordingly the, uh, uh, the the laws been made so those laws uh, that you have to uh, focus more upon when you talk about uh, the social transformation now when we have the social transformation one more important point is the sexual harassment okay so woman is having her dignity okay and uh, 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 she she must be provided with a uh, certain kind of basic principles of law and the legal provisions so that uh, her honor can be uh, taken care of by the society at large and dignity of women uh, no, it shall not be uh, been treated or no it, or that woman shall not be the victim of the humiliation or torture or exploitation when we understand the indian situation we know that uh, the gender based violence is is uh, is very common um, yeah. and so that's why there's need to have the gender uh, justice system okay so our laws are also uh, to some extent uh, we can find that are not uh, 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 are not lacking behind uh, to recognize a woman uh, at par with the with the men and so that's why uh, the supreme court has decided uh, by uh, uh, very decided in the various cases that uh, the supreme court is the custodian of the fundamental rights and therefore uh, the dignity of a woman has also to be uh, cross verified by the supreme court if such kind of cases are before them and so there are a number of cases like uh, your manika gandhi versus union of india or uh, francis cardell versus union of territory of delhi so all these cases are you know are, they, they mean something more than just physical survival and it's not confined to the protection of the faculty or or limb through which life is enjoyed or the soul communicates with outside world but includes the right to live uh, with a human dignity so this is uh, this is the wording has been given by um, by the supreme court uh, while deciding the cases in respect with the dignity of women now when it comes to the sexual harassment we know that there are a number of amendments been carried out uh, in the indian penal code as well as uh, in other uh, respective laws uh, where they have made it uh, made it a point that uh, we must have physical uh, uh, the sexual harassment which includes an unwelcome sexual uh, determined behavior uh, like uh, physical contact and advances or the demand or the request of the sexual favors or a sexually colored remarks or showing pornography or any other unwelcome physical verbal or non verbal conduct 
uh, of a sexual nature. So all that been included in the sexual harassment. Now we know that um, uh, marital rape was more concerned in, uh, nowadays we can, uh, we can see that more, um, more and more people are coming up um, uh, on the issue of the marital rape. And you know, we also need some kind of you know, more focus on uh, such kind of the issues where you know, at some point of time, something uh, we are not able to prove in the court of law. Okay? But again, at the same point, we know that uh, the court without evidence cannot proceed. And so that's why you have to see that both the things can be uh, can be mashed together and uh, accordingly the laws can develop. Accordingly, the laws can be developed uh, in this concern. Now you know that uh, no, uh, in the Indian Penal Code, uh, you have uh, a number of things uh, like you have uh, the criminal, uh, the assault or a criminal force to women uh, with intent to outrage of her modesty. Uh, you have uh, the defamation uh, in context with the women. Uh, basically, uh, no, you, you already have you you, uh, you all are well versed with the uh, with the uh, with the sections of the Indian Penal Code uh, where the uh, cognizance and uh, bailable offences have uh, been uh, given. Uh, basically, if you you know if you if you try to um, uh, read out a uh, number of uh, provisions of Indian Penal Code, you will find the uh, things that word and gesture or the act intended to insult the modesty of women. Uh, how it uh, no how uh, so what what exactly is the uh, uh, is umbrella which has been given in that particular context uh, when it, when we talk about uh, the rights of women um, uh, and the uh, sexual harassment specifically or the defamation specifically uh, in the same context uh, we also know that uh, we have the indecent representation of women prohibition act uh, 1987 so if an individual harasses in another with books photographs, painting, films, uh, pamphlet, packages uh, containing the indecent representation of women, uh, they are also liable uh, for, for, you know, uh, for the sentence. Uh, they'll be behind the bars and uh, further, uh, the companies have uh, been responsible uh, where there has been indecent representation of women, uh, such as the display of the pornography on the premises. So, no, all that uh, also IRWPA is also one of the important elements uh, when we talk about women and the social transformation. Okay. Now, uh, the, the important aspect in between is about uh, Vishakha versus State of Rajasthan, where uh, we have talked about the Tiro Convention and its implementation uh, in the form of uh, legal provisions. Okay. So whenever we talk about the sexual harass harassment at workplaces, uh, where any such acts is uh, committed in circumstances where under the victim of such conduct has reasonable apprehension that in relation to the victim's employment or work, whether she is uh, drawing salary or honorium or voluntary, whether in government, public, private enterprise, such conduct can be humiliating and may constitute a health and safety problem it amounts to sexual harassment so in this context now we have uh, the specific law to deal with such kind of the uh, areas okay so this is how we are no we are we are making uh, a point that at every uh, phase we must protect and we must have at least a law as a tool um, so that the women can take uh, no, a woman can leave the society uh, irrespective of uh, uh, any hurdles or obstacles. Okay, and so in that context, uh, uh, you no, know, we are we are developing so that as uh, you no, know, the transformation is being taken place uh, in that context as well. Now uh, we also know that under the same uh, enactment uh, uh, prevention of uh, sexual harassment at workplaces act. Um, is uh, no, uh, we, we need to uh, no, we need to have uh, certainly some kind of the guidelines for all the institutions uh, where the women are working, and we also have uh, to provide a minimum uh, requirements uh, which has been uh, prescribed by the enactment. Specifically, they must have the women who are working. They must have access 
to uh, you know to all the facilities uh, then specifically when we talk about if there is sexual harassment they must have an access uh, to get justice so there shall be some kind kind of committee where the uh, committee must have uh, the women uh, into uh, into it as a committee member and then uh, the scrutiny of the complaint to be made by the um, by that particular women employer uh, shall also be there uh, we also know that uh, there are other laws which are also applicable in this concern uh, specifically um, uh, specifically when when we talk about uh, the complaints and the criminal proceedings and the disciplinary actions all these things uh, shall be through some kind of the system uh, which is to be established by that particular institution and so uh, similarly uh, the third party harassment is also been discussed in this context okay so this is also one of the part that uh, that we need to uh, talk on uh, talk upon then uh, we have uh, the um, indian penal code uh, specifically uh, some of the provisions where causing miscarriage or causing miscarriage without the consent of woman uh, or if it is if the act is done uh, with intent to prevent the child being born alive uh, or the cause it uh, to die after the birth uh, it has its punishment uh, then we have uh, the penalizing for provisions uh, for buying and of minor girls for the purpose of prostitution uh, kidnapping uh, from the legal guardian uh, kidnapping uh, abduction all the provisions in that relate uh, in that context uh, the uh, procuration of the minor girl uh, the you know uh, importation of the girl from the foreign country so all these uh, things are already been uh, incorporated in indian penal code um, and some of them been you know revised and some of them been uh, you know made uh, uh, been added uh, to the amendment so now when we have the social transformation when we are studying social transformation so we are not going to understand only uh, what happened with a woman and what type of the transformation at a societal level it taken place but as a student of law we have to correlate it with the legal developments in the society okay so uh, we know that uh, in india the ancient law uh, been given by the manu and yatni valken uh, no, uh, they entrusted the responsibility of protecting the female upon the father husband and son at the various stages of life okay so we have started from that point and now we have reached that uh, we need to have that kind of the legal provision through the legislators and interpretation through the uh, judicial officers uh, so that to get no uh, get them or make them responsible uh, for uh, the protection of uh, the concern of uh, uh, concern phase of the female uh, in their life so basically the the parental and the quasi parental right on the part of the father and the husband has to protect from the evils is is a basic for the uh, mild disciplines and uh, uh, the wife's duty to act according to the reasonable words of the husband also subjected to her uh, to some amount of the regimentation okay so all these things uh, you can uh, 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 these things been uh, you have to percolate into uh, the legal norms and so the uh, uh, you can see uh, in various judgments given by various courts not only the uh, supreme court but the high courts as well um uh, not to uh, to some extent i can refer to the madras high court uh, who discussed uh, the legality of wife uh, beating uh, in uh, subaya uh, gondon case in uh, 1939 uh, where the session judge of the madras district court uh, had exempted the husband from the criminal liability for beating his wife as the husband had right uh, to uh, not to batter his wife so no again you have the references where uh, you know such kind of things also been happen at a judiciary uh, in in you no know, at at uh, judicial part and then so uh, so at at that point of time probably um, the, the laws were not there uh, to deal uh, with such kind of the um, uh, things uh, which were happening at the society level uh, in context with the status of women and so that's why uh you can also have uh, you can you can see the references uh, of various other uh, 
uh, we can say, uh, are rather implications of such kind of things. You can also find it out uh, when it comes to the appeal uh, and uh, when the uh, when different kind of uh, the things being uh, incorporated in the Domestic Violence Act as well uh, in 2005. Now, uh, the act uh, basically um, is there. Um, so, uh, you know, when you read the Domestic Violence Act, uh, it's in comprehensive uh, in nature. So, uh, at, uh, so Section 3 uh, basically of the act, uh, you know, it, it uh, defines domestic violence. Uh, it says that it, you know, it includes the harms or injuries or it endangers the health, safety, life, limb, well-being, etc. Okay, so you, know, you can find there four important clauses and you know, they have enlisted the number of elements which amounts to uh, the domestic violence. Okay, so that is one of the part. When, you, uh, when we talk about uh, the uh, crimes against the women uh, recognized by the other laws, uh, you'll find it out that the police records, if you find it out, uh, you know, that shows that how uh, the highest indecent uh, in uh, highest incidences that happen uh, when you, when we talk about uh, the uh, women and uh, the crimes uh, which are increasing day by day. Okay, so if you, you know if you refer to the National Crime Records Bureau reports, uh, you would find that every year uh, you can uh, see a consistent increase uh, in the uh, in the in the crimes against women. Okay, uh, specifically. Uh, no, uh, earlier many cases were not registered with the police due to the social stigma attached to rape and molestation cases. Uh, but now you can see that those cases are also uh, increasing in number, and that is that is uh, that is not good. And so that's why we need to uh, again have the transformation in the implementing part as well as in the awareness part. Okay. Because it's just not that we are going to make the law and it is going to change the status of women uh, in, in just a day, but we need to have, uh, no, we need to again inculcate the moral spirit, uh, we need to inculcate uh, the, uh, the fundamental norms in the society, uh, rejuvenate the things which already been uh, no, with, with which we have started the society or civilization, where we have started no, uh, during certain point of time. No, we say that it's a, uh, it's a, where, where, wherever we uh, worship women, uh, there, there only uh, we can find the God. So uh, we also have that culture and that culture is important uh, in this context. Now we'll just quickly go ahead uh, with uh, one more important aspect in context with the woman in social transformation, that is the dowry. So in 1961, the government of India passed the Dowry Prohibition Act and uh, making the dowry demand in the wedding arrangements is illegal that they have said. Uh, but uh, still, uh, we have uh, the reports, we have uh, the crime reports, we have the law commission reports, we have various reports given by the uh, NGOs, uh, which talk about uh, this particular aspect of dowry is still uh, going on. Okay, so. As we know, we're talking about social transformation at certain point of time, the system of dowry was different. But when it comes to uh, the modern aspect, the system uh, is, uh, I mean, the, no, the base is same, but uh, no, we can find the modified version of uh, demand of the dowry, you can see it uh, nowadays, okay? And so that's why uh, we need to understand that uh, how uh, dowry prohibition uh, basically, the maintenance of the lists of the presents to be bride and bridegrooms. Uh, rules were framed uh, during that point of time. And then uh, a 1997 report uh, which claimed that 5,000 women die uh, each year because of the dowry deaths. Okay? So, at least a dozen die each day in kitchen fires uh, thought to be intentional. Okay? Uh, so, that's why no, a number of, uh, we can say, angels that come up at that point of time. And we can see uh, that um, uh, the law is there and implementation is there. And even the interest of uh, the uh, stakeholders, I mean, uh, stakeholders in context with the implementation. So basically, the administrators, the NGOs, and uh, the welfare association. So these type of people, they, uh, no, they, um, they take um, very much efforts uh, to you know, uh, to curb particular issue of the dowry and then uh, 
uh, to have you know more better we can say life to women okay so this is also one of the stage that we can find uh, in the history where where the dowry which was which was there in prior uh, or uh, primitive society but again uh, the way it you know uh, it devastated the life of women uh, during uh, 60s 70s and 80s and then uh, slowly we, we can see that there's a development that happened along with the uh, legal provisions uh, regarding the dowry now in between we also have uh, one of the important element and that is the uh, legal prohibition of the sati system so uh, we know that the practice of sati uh, burning or uh, occasionally uh, burying a widow alive with her deceased husband so uh, it's kind of an ancient evil that we had okay uh, you have studied the uh, uh, along with uh, the social transformation you must have studied the jurisprudence of the legal theory paper so where you can see that uh, we you know we say that uh, historical school of jurisprudence it says that uh, the laws are not made but uh, we can find the law in the history itself okay so when you read the history at the same time you will find it out how the uh, laws been made and how the laws been transformed so during certain point of time you may find that the surface uh, the surface system was legal because there was uh, no law to curb or to prohibit this particular system but when uh, again the uh, the transformation took place uh, people were made and uh, made aware about the things uh, in context with the uh, sati system uh, no then we can find that there's uh, there's more uh, we can say in a medieval period we can see some some of the muslim kings like uh, muhammad bin tughlaq and humayun uh, they took strong exception to this practice as an inhuman and imposed the hurdles to the practice by requiring the royal assent uh, so the uh, or the consent uh, so this kind of the development that took place uh, we also know that in the British policy, the sati was initially uh, obsessed by the sense of the cultural superiority and white man's assumed role of uh, purging the barbaric practices. And then uh, we know that uh, the British campaign against the practice of the sati culminated in the big development. Uh, basically, Sir William Bentick, uh, you must know uh, his name, the Governor General of India at that point of time. Uh, with the help of the initiatives taken by uh, Raja Ram Mohan Roy, uh, they have come up with the prohibition of this uh, practice uh, through the regulation uh, in 1829. So 1829 regulation of, uh, on the Sati Pratha abolition have uh, been then uh, converted to uh, the act uh, which came into effect from 21st March uh, 1988. Okay, so see this is how uh, the social transformation took place uh, in context with the Sati system. Uh, basically, Sati system uh, have been defined first by Section 2C uh, of the Sair Act. It says that any widow along with the body of her husband or any other relative or with any article, object or thing associated with the husband or such relative or any woman along with the body of any of her relative, irrespective of whether such burning or burning is claimed to be voluntarily on the part of the widow or the woman or otherwise, uh, then such kind of burning or burying alive is to be considered as a sati. So you can see that sometimes it may happen that uh, the husband is uh, not alive and uh, he died in the war. So in this context, you can see that generally, at that point of time, a woman usually uh, have been uh, burned uh, with the object uh, which was, you know, which is basically belonging to uh, uh, her uh, husband, and so that also. That also been included uh, into uh, uh, in
that also been included uh, into uh, the uh, into the such system uh, or the prohibition of uh, of the such system enactment. Uh, then, uh, when it comes to female infanticide, okay, so it is also one of the important point uh, to be discussed. Now, when we have the female infanticide, we know that India has um, uh, or uh, basically the low sex ratio, uh, which which we can see uh, for many years. Uh, when when we talk about uh, the uh, the male and female ratio in India, uh, the chief reason being that many women die before reaching the adulthood. Okay, uh, basically the tribal societies in India have a better sex ratio than all the other uh, groups uh, if we put together. So this is uh, in spite of the fact that the tribal communities have far lower levels of the income. So literacy and the health facilities. Um, uh, is also one of the concern. So it is therefore suggested by many experts that the low sex ratio in India can be attributed to the female infanticide and sex selective abortions. So uh, basically, the practice of female infanticide is prevalent in certain parts of India, um, uh, specifically to some group of people in 80s and 90s. Um, that was biased. Uh, at that point of time, and the uh, difficulties in giving in marriage, the girls' marriageable age due to extra virgin expenses of the marriage problem, uh, basically the dowry. So such kind of the things uh, uh, were there at that point of time, and so that's why, uh, uh, no, uh, female mm -hmm. infanticide was one of the issue that's still in existence in India. So all medical tests that can be used to determine the sex of the child have been banned in India. That's why. Uh, and so, uh, due to the incidence of these tests being used uh, to get rid of unwanted female children before birth. So, basically, the female infanticide, that is, killing of uh, a girl infant, is still prevalent in uh, some of the rural and uh, the urban areas as well. Okay, it is not only uh, with the rural areas, we can find uh, such kind of things uh, in, the, uh, in the urban areas as well. Okay. So uh, the abuse of the dowry tradition has been one of the main reasons, as we have said, for the sex selective abortions and the female infanticides in India. Now, at the same time, we also know that uh, the abortion uh, is permitted on the uh, therapeutic grounds. Okay, so abortions are only permitted on the medical grounds uh, in order to protect the life of the mother. That is to say, the unborn child must not be destroyed except for the purpose of uh, preserving the yet more precious life of the mother. Okay? And so that's why uh, medical termination of the pregnancy act 1971, uh, where uh, you know, India liberalized its abortion uh, law by uh, abortion law by the by this enactment, uh, and uh, which permitted abortion uh, in number of conditions. So unless you have uh, that condition been fulfilled, uh, then only you can have uh, the abortion, the uh, MTP Act of 1971, it's applicable. Okay. Uh, then uh, we also have uh, the uh, PCPN uh, DT Act, that is uh, preconception and prenatal diagnostic techniques, that is the prohibition of the Sex Selection Act of 2003, which also talks about the sex selection and the uh, no, uh, the punishment on uh, on it. Okay. Uh, now, uh, one of the important context that also uh, here that we talk about is uh, the rights of an unborn child. Okay. Uh, now here, uh, instead of unborn child, we may say that uh, the child who is in the mother's womb, because unborn child may have a different context uh, when it comes to the transfer of property act. Okay. So that is not even in mother's womb that can be also be considered, and so that's why uh, the the child who is uh, is who's not born. Um, now, human rights is that concept where we say that uh, these are the rights. Uh, uh, why we say that is a human right? Because uh, uh, no, we ask them to uh, have the duties. Okay, so rights and duties they go in hand in hand, and so that's why we say that the uh, human rights of an individual. Okay, uh, but the human rights uh, uh, we cannot say that uh, uh, the individuals so or animal rights we say uh, so those uh, do not come under the human rights. Okay. Why it is so? Because animals, they are not uh, able to ask for their rights or, no, we cannot uh, put uh, the, them under the, some, some duties. We cannot ask them to perform some duties. And so that's why their rights have been discussed uh, in different ways. 
<clears throat> in the same way, when we talk about the child who is in mother's womb, it's also we cannot uh, no, ask them to perform some kind of duty. And so that's why, uh, apart from that, uh, that's why the rights of uh, such kind of child who is in the mother's womb also be discussed separately. Okay. Uh, so when you discuss your jurisprudence paper, the legal theory paper, uh, specifically the legal concepts to be discussed, we find that uh, in the con uh, in the uh, in the in the uh, area of the personality, you will find that we discuss uh, this uh, type of the rights where you uh, know though it is in the mother's womb, but still uh, we see that uh, you know, the rights uh, to some extent also been possessed by that particular uh, child who is in the mother's womb. Okay, so uh, according to the basic principles of the human right, all human beings born free and equal in dignity and rights. Uh, uh, no, and also no discrimination on the basis of uh, race, color, language, religion. Uh, uh, no, in respect of these, we have to protect the rights of an individual. And so at the same time, we have the right uh, to life and personal liberty and security of women, which also includes her right to terminate the pregnancy, uh, depend on whether or not the exercise of such right would affect the right of life of unborn child. So unborn child is the person under Article 20 of the Constitution because life begins immediately after uh, conceiving and some believe uh, life begins only after the completion of the first uh, trimester. And so accordingly, the law has been developed in context with the termination of the pregnancy. Uh, now coming down to uh, gender injustice, uh, rather various forms of gender injustice uh, is basically uh, the women's group that started emerging in India in early 90s, uh, 100, uh, at, the, uh, at the first when we talk about the social reforms uh, in that concern. And you will find it out that uh, the very first and the most important thing uh, when we talk about uh, gender injustice or rather um, uh, uh, a step towards having a gender justice is basically recognizing them the right to vote that is the first thing and then their representation uh, into uh, various uh, bodies okay if you find that uh, or if you understand uh, the rights uh, the right to vote uh, at an international platform you will find that uh, no it was not an easy way uh, that the woman got right to vote uh, at an international platform if you understand the uh, uh, the, the European culture, uh, the American uh, tradition or American history or uh, the Indian history. So Indian Indians got easily, uh, the, I mean, the women, they got right uh, to vote easily as compared to the rest of the world uh, because uh, to get right to vote, uh, women had fought a lot at an international platform and then uh, Accordingly, the countries they have recognized this particular right, and then when they got the right, then uh, slowly uh, their representation uh, been there uh, started in the uh, in having uh, the administrative. You no, know, we can we can see that women are there in the administration. Um, uh, specifically, uh, when we uh, consider the Indian situation, we know that uh, you know, there's a reservation for women in the parliament and state assemblies. Uh, despite the women's representation, uh, you know, uh, thing is also being closed uh, you know, in context with the uh, Constitution of India. We also know that uh, Article 14, Article 15, all those articles 15, 3, 16, 21, 23. So all these are a part and parcel of uh, you know, having the uh, gender uh, justice uh, or in achieving the gender justice in context using women. Now, when we talk about uh, again the directive principles of state policy, also uh, they provide to certain extent, uh, to some extent, uh, the rights of rights specifically to women. So, Article 39A, uh, 51A, E. Uh, so, these are uh, uh, the important articles uh, where we can see that adequate means of livelihood for men and women they shall be equally and uh, specifically. Uh, the constitution provides that it will be the duty of every citizen to renounce practices derogatory to dignity of women 
so india uh, in constitution calls for uh, eight years of compulsory education uh, 6 to 14 and uh, we also know that uh, right to education how it emerged uh, as a part of the constitution uh, from um, um, article 21a insertion of article 21a and now we have number of enactments uh, which also talk about uh, the rights of the female and the male so both uh, so here uh, we can say uh, that's why probably uh, no, we are able to break the bias between uh, the male and women by making the respective laws and the respective amendments when we uh, talk about uh, the people of uh, people of india were guaranteed equal pay for the equal work in the constitution and they're also reinforced by the equal remuneration act as well okay so uh, you can Zoom see the clarity Uh, we can also have the reference to the Vishaka and uh, state of Raj Vishaka versus state of Rajasthan, where um, I know the Supreme Court has laid down certain guidelines pertaining to the sexual harassment that we already have talked about. Uh, we also now uh, have uh, discussed that particular breaking of bias uh, in context with the um, uh, with the uh, Indian Penal Code, uh, with the uh, Domestic Violence Act. We have. Uh, uh, various amendments been carried out uh, in context with the uh, penal provisions. Uh, the most important thing uh, that I must uh, uh, talk about is Article 51 of the Constitution, which imposes uh, the obligation of the state uh, to foster the respect uh, for international law and treaty. And in an international platform, we know that number of the conventions, so basically the CEDAW Convention, ICCPR, ICSCR, uh, we can we have the reference of various cases like uh, Mutuma versus Union of India, or uh, one of the favorite cases uh, that people usually write in their examinations uh, is uh, 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 Air India versus Nargis Mirza uh, uh, in relation with the service condition that terminated the service of an air hostess and become the pregnant was stuck down uh, uh, as being the discriminatory. Then you have the case of the Vasanta versus Union of India. In, uh, in talking with the 66, uh, section 66 of the Factories Act. So if you understand all these uh, rules and regulations being carried out in context of the women are now, uh, you know, uh, you know, are now uh, uh, basically providing a good environment uh, and uh, a slight, you know, we have to push the things uh, when it comes to uh, the amendments to the, uh, to the respective laws. So this is uh, one of the important part. Now, when I was talking about uh, uh, the uh, laws and the women, we, we also have to understand uh, that uh, look, now we are coming up with the uh, with the uh, you know, compensatory jurisprudence. Okay, so basically, um, to some extent, uh, we were not adding uh, the uh, things like. No, a compensation in the criminal cases, uh, but now you know that uh, when uh, we know that there's uh, rehabilitation or certain things that we have to carry out when uh, we can see there's a mental trauma, uh, which is been, uh, no, where the victim is suffering through such kind of the things. And so that's why we need to uh, no, uh, take that uh, woman out of that trauma, out of that situation. And we need to have the correctional things that we have to uh, do. And for all these things, uh, now the court uh, started uh, no, imposing the compensation also, uh, so that uh, that will help the victims of various uh, uh, you know, various uh, crimes, uh, the women victims of the crimes, uh, so that they can come out of uh, all that particular situation. In addition to that, we had the role of the National Commission for Women. So, uh, National Commission for Women, which was established in January 1992 uh, with this uh, National Commission for Women Act of 1990. Uh, the Human Rights Commission was established in 1993 under the Human Rights Act 1993. Uh, there's a protection of the Human Rights Act 1993, which provides for the constitution of NHRC, 
and the SHRC, State Human Rights Commission, National Human Rights Commission. And the National Human Rights Commission uh, was set up in October 1993. So all these important um, uh, aspects, uh, so basically the NHRC has the power of the civil court uh, to summon the person and record the evidence and investigate both sumo and individual complaints and uh, violations of the human rights. So every proceeding before the commission is, an, is a judicial proceedings under, under the law, okay? So uh, such kind of things are also been there. Uh, we know that uh, NCW, National Commission for Women, uh, is a collegiate body consisting of the chairperson, <coughs> excuse me, uh, the members, the secretary members, and the central government is having a kind of an hold over it. The NCW have to perform a number of functions like investigate and examine the matters relating to the safeguard provided for the women under the constitution and the laws. Uh, they also have to do, uh, also have to present the, uh, uh, present to the central government annually uh, on the other, uh, other times, the reports on the working of these safeguards, whether it is working or not. And they also have to make the recommendations for the effective implementation of those uh, safeguards for improving the condition of women by the union uh, or uh, any state. They also have to review uh, the existing provisions of the constitution and the other laws affecting the women and recommend for the amendment to overcome the shortcomings uh, if there are any. Uh, NCW is also having, uh, is, is also have to take up the case cases of violation of the provisions of the constitution if there are any and other laws also uh, to women with an appropriate authorities. Uh, NCW has to look into the complaints and take the sumoto uh, notice of the matters relating to the uh, deprivation of the women's right, non-implementation of the laws enacted to provide the protection to women, uh, non-compliance with the policy decisions or guidelines. In all these contexts, uh, NCW is having the right to take the sumoto notices. Uh, then also they have to call for the social uh, social and special studies uh, uh, and the investigations into the specific problems or situations uh, if they are there in context with the women. So they have to undertake uh, the promotion and the educational research. Uh, they have to participate and revise the planning process for socioeconomic development of women. They have to evaluate the progress of the development of women under the union and the uh, union and any state. Uh, they have to also inspect the cause to be inspected in a jail, uh, remand home, uh, women's institutions, or any other places in this concern. And you know, uh, they also have to fund the litigations involving the issues affecting the large body of women. So if you, uh, you know, if you see that almost everything is covered by NCW and been made responsible uh, for, uh, for all these uh, elements, okay? So you can see that because of the uh, National Commission for Women, you can see uh, there's a uh, huge, um, we can say positive attitude been, uh, been there, uh, made or been, been there as a social part of social transformation. You can see, uh, you know, that that definitely is helping uh, to, you know, to give uh, or you know, to, uh, to treat or to give the gender justice, uh, you know, to break the bias between the men and women or uh, but, uh, to, in context with the system, okay. So all these things uh, that are there, uh, you know, in context with the uh, uh, with the initiatives, rather we can say uh, these initiatives are basically for the betterment of women and this, you know, to, uh, to have good status in the society. So the Indian criminal law has uh, substantive uh, components and the policies to deal with the uh, offences against women. So people's participation civil society's initiative. So all these already have contributed to sensitize uh, in context with the rights of women or gender uh, system. So if you try to understand the major trend of development, uh, then you'll find it out that uh, now uh, the society is starting having reforms uh, in a substantial law as well. Uh, and you can also see the progressive judgments been there by the Supreme Court, by the High Court, uh, in context with the uh, status of women, okay. So, uh, Supreme Court, legislators, high courts, and even the local authorities, local courts, 
they're also uh, trying to make uh, whatever the efforts that uh, that is that are possible for them and uh, to have uh, to, to, to give uh, an equal opportunity to them uh, to give sustainable uh, sustainability or uh, consistency in the rights and the status of women. Uh, we also have to understand that uh, when we talk about the reformation for liberalization of, of women uh, during British era, uh, we also have to think of, uh, we also have to read about the reformers like Mahatma Jyotira Phule, uh, uh, Raja Ram Mohan Roy, uh, Ishwar Chandra Vidya Sagar, uh, Dr. B. R. Ambedkar, uh, and specifically the movement, uh, the movement uh, of women libera uh, uh, liberation in context with the um, you know, with an Indian independence, you can you can have you, you must have studied this particular part. Uh, then you also have the uh, constitution provisions, other legislation that we already have uh, referred to, uh, the protection of the rights of the Human Rights Act is also one of it, and the national policy for empowerment of women, uh, and various schemes thereupon uh, been there uh, in context with the Panchayat Raj system specifically the 73rd and the 74th amendment to the Indian constitution in 1993. Uh, CEDAW convention, you also can have the reference to. Uh, we have certainly some government initiated policies like uh, Sarva Shiksha Abhiyan. Uh, we have the national program for universal primary education. Uh, we have uh, Swayam Siddha. Uh, we have STEP, that is support to training and empowerment program. Uh, RMT, that is Rashtriya Manila Kosh. Uh, then we have the SGSY, we have uh, uh, no, uh, Swarm Jayanti Gram Swarozgar Yojana, Sampurna Gramin Rozgar Yojana, SGRY, uh, we have uh, Swarm Jayanti Shahari Rozgar Yojana as well uh, to assist uh, the urban as well as uh, the rural community uh, in context with the, uh, with the, uh, with the woman. Okay. So this is regarding the social transformation and women. Okay. Now let us uh, quickly go ahead uh, with uh, the welfare policies in context with the child. Okay. So when we talk about uh, the children, uh, then we know that the number of uh, Uh, we can see that uh, in uh, most of the context, so when we read the constitutional provisions, we'll find that uh, almost uh, all the provisions, uh, wherever uh, the woman word, uh, we can see, uh, we can also uh, not see the word child. Okay, So uh, it is also that we consider as uh, one of the uh, vulnerable uh, group of individuals because uh, when it comes to the rights of the child, it, uh, it gets you know, uh, easily been violated uh, because you know, they are they're not aware of their uh, basic rights, fundamental rights. And so uh, all the rights that they wish to have is to the, uh, to the guardian. Okay? And so when you have uh, such kind of the situation, uh, we also know that uh, uh, you know, uh, we also have to think about it uh, from uh, all the angles okay because uh, children uh, when we consider we have the a number of laws like child labor we have the child prostitution uh, then we have uh, uh, the custody of the child or basically if you understand uh, you know when the matter is before the court of law regarding uh, the paternity issues generally uh, if the court sees that uh, that kind of the things uh, if they are going to hamper the uh, future of the child then probably uh, well, they have to think about uh, it from that perspective and accordingly they have they're going to give the permission to uh, some of the test okay then we also know that uh, adoption of the children uh, is also one of the important point uh, that you need to discuss in context with the children okay so uh, basically uh, when we talk about uh, the children we know that there are a number of the offenses uh, also, you can find it out uh, into uh, um, no, uh, into various enactments. Okay, let, let us try to understand the uh, different perspectives of the child acts. Okay, now uh, when we talk about the children, uh, we know that uh, the legal policy towards them uh, has undergone a huge change so far. Okay, uh, no, now whenever we have human dignity, uh, you know, when 
where they you know where we are now considering the dignity of each and every individual so child is also one of that uh, uh, one of the group of people okay so growth of human rights uh, perception regarding the child uh, you know uh, uh, we can say that that particularly the movement for creating the child friendly environment uh, we can see in uh, when we uh, see the transformation uh, of the system okay now uh, understand it from the perspective of the jurisprudence you will find it out that uh, uh, no, uh, you can see that the western jurisprudence on the rights of the child uh, started uh, with uh, the uh, parents claim of a patria protestas so on behalf of the children uh, that the world at the large would not interfere uh, with his custody and the control of the child uh, with the industrial services from the child and with the uh, chastity of female child as well okay so from that angle we also have to think of the child rights and uh, that jurisprudence is also going to help us uh, to formulate various laws and to have the interpretation of uh, various basic principles uh, in protecting the rights of children uh, rights of children okay uh, we know that uh, child labor is uh, one of the things uh, that in MC Mehta versus State of Tamil Nadu 97, uh, the Supreme Court has issued the direction uh, the state governments to ensure the fulfillment of the legislative intention behind the child labor or the Prohibition Regulation Act of 86. Uh, because they say that tackling, uh, no, they, they, they were tackling the seriousness uh, of uh, the socioeconomic problem. Uh, the Supreme Court has directed the offending uh, employer to pay the compensation of 20,000 uh, for every child employed in this concern. We also know that uh, we have various cases where, like uh, you have the Dauro Jain versus Union of India of 97, uh, where the Apex Court uh, they issued the direction for uh, rescue and the rehabilitation of the uh, child prostitutes and the uh, children of the uh, prostitutes as well. So you can see that uh, these kind of, uh, 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 no, uh, we can say, but uh, no, these kind of the things been happening in the society uh, to have, you know, uh, to to uh, to again, uh, uh, give the better uh, environment to the child or to children as well. And when it comes to um, uh, one of the uh, important elements that is the maintenance, uh, you can find that in. Uh, uh, Dimple Gupta versus Rajiv Gupta of 2008, the uh, Supreme Court uh, has granted the maintenance to illegitimate child under uh, 125 CRPC. So, uh, this was the path breaking uh, judgment which has been given a uh, breathe to the innocent children who were victim of no fault of their own. So, these type of the verdicts given by the judicial authorities, uh, the judicial instruments of the social ordering, uh, you, can, you, can, you can very much see. So, uh, even in the constitution, if you try to understand, you will find uh, that in the constitution itself, uh, we'll see that number of provisions uh, which is having uh, almost the same uh, thing. I mean, uh, no, the protection of uh, the child rights uh, from just not a fundamental rights perspective, but uh, you can have the reference to the fundamental duties, you have the reference to the directive principles of state policy as well. In context with the child labor, uh, we have the special laws and at an international platform also, uh, we have uh, the ILO, uh, uh, International Labor Organization, uh, who has adopted a charter of, uh, for children uh, regarding uh, the child labor. So they have adopted uh, a number of uh, important aspects in, con in concern with the medical and health, uh, health uh, medical and health safety measures uh, for the child workers uh, wherever the childs are allowed to work so along with that we also have the human rights which was developed at an international platform uh, the child's development and the human rights uh, the rights uh, in pertaining to the dignity of child uh, was majorly focused by article 32 of the uh, un convention on the rights of child uh, 1989 so uh, you can very much see that the convention adopted uh, by ILO as well as the UN Convention on Rights of Child uh, and the respective provisions, they are going to have uh, you know, a specific focus on the rights of the children uh, regarding the provision for the minimum age, uh, the minimum age uh, for the admission to the employment. They also provide the appropriate regulation and the hours 
um, they also provide for the condition of the employment um, they provide for the appropriate penalties or the sanctions uh, wherever there is a violation of the law so in all contexts at an international platform or international law provides uh, uh, no, the, uh, provides these particular points and accordingly uh, all the uh, countries they have adopted incorporated uh, these particular uh, points uh, while framing their own laws. When we talk about the domestic laws in India in that concern, we know that uh, the Royal Commission on the Labour, uh, which was there in 1929, uh, they have noticed the wide prevalence of the practice of uh, child labour in India uh, with long, hour, uh, long hours of the working. And so that's why uh, the recommendation of the Commission uh, been made uh, regarding the Central Legislative Assembly uh, that's why the Children um, uh, Act 1933, uh, it came into existence, uh, which imposed the penalty upon the employers uh, when uh, uh, those uh, who are making the child to work, specifically the age criteria that they have defined is the 15 years of age. Then uh, there's uh, the development in the law. Uh, we know that the founding fathers of the constitution have bestowed the thoughts on the protection of the child from exploitative works and now we can see more developmental or more modernized uh, things uh, though we have we also still have uh, the jurisprudential part attached to uh, such kind of the development in the in the legal perspective uh, then uh, when we talk about uh, the constitution we know that uh, uh, apart from the constitution uh, we have various enactments like Motor Transport Workers Act, uh, we have the Mines Act of 1952, uh, we have Merchant Shipping Act of 51. So these are the acts uh, pertaining uh, to that particular uh, aspect of the children. Now coming down to the last part, uh, that is the uh, judicial approach uh, in this concern. As we know that uh, Bandhuha Mukti Morcha is one of the important uh, uh, aspect uh, that talked about uh, the child labor. Apart from that, I also know that uh, uh, Rajangam versus state of Tamil Nadu uh, uh, of 92, the case of 92, uh, where the employment of the children in the BD manufacture was considered as a violative of uh, the BD and the Cigar Workers Act of 66. Okay, So we have some specific uh, enactments as well. Uh, we also know that the landmark judgment given in MC Mehta versus state of Tamil Nadu that we have referred uh, noted that in uh, Sivakasi uh, on the 31st December 85, there were uh, 221 uh, registered match factories employing uh, 27,000 workmen, of whom 2,940 were the children. So, see uh, this that we have started uh, discussing since 1996, and now we have um, no more uh, better version of the legal provisions. Uh, to uh, legal provisions in pertaining to the protection of the uh, child rights. Now, we also know uh, that there's a uh, national program of action for the protection of the child, child rights. We also know that uh, there are a number of NGOs who are working on uh, the child rights and their protection. CRI is one of the international platform uh, in this concern uh, who is working on it. We have uh, various provisions on the uh, child prostitution and the law, uh, where uh, we have different kind of commissions uh, where they have recommended uh, certain things, and we already have adopted it um, either through Indian Penal Code or by making the special laws uh, pertaining uh, to the child prostitution. Coming down to the educational aspect, we know that 21A is there already uh, in the Constitution as to the amendments. Uh, attempts to bring uh, the right to education uh, statute uh, has also been there and now we have uh, not uh, as a best statute uh, for the protection of the children uh, uh, specifically in context with the um, the primary education uh, we also need to have uh, some measures to be taken into consideration uh, with the mental health of uh, of uh, the child as well Okay, because it is just not the education which is going to help them uh, specifically a uh, post pandemic uh, uh, phase, uh, but we also have to think upon it from uh, from the angle of 
uh, uh, the mental health and the physical health of an uh, individual. Okay. Uh, now coming down to the last part for today's session uh, in context with the social transformation and the child, uh, we know that uh, whenever we talk about uh, uh, the children, uh, the, apart from improving uh, the conditions of uh, uh, of their life, apart from improving the conditions at every point of time in socio, uh, mental, uh, physical strength, uh, at the same point, uh, we have the educational aspect. So all these aspects to be taken into consideration in this concern. So child, children's inevitable dependence upon the others make them the vulnerable. Okay? And so that's why uh, where, you know, uh, wherever it's possible, we have to have the uh, private actors, uh, we have the life, um, no, we have the uh, different kind of stakeholders uh, where we can take the help of them to have a kind of a more, um, we can say, uh, awareness can be created in, uh, in context with the rights of uh, rights of children. Uh, we, we, ha we have to, it, it's, it's must to think from the uh, different perspectives, like health is one of the important aspects. Uh, uh, the education is another aspect and the security is a third important aspect that we have to focus uh, when we talk about uh, the child welfare uh, uh, law and the social transformation. Uh, we know uh, for making them available uh, the private actors need to be uh, cautioned uh, and uh, since mere legal framework cannot do that people's participation and the creative leadership is also important and it is not of the only NGO but the civil societies uh, they also need to have the contribution in the success of the legal policies in per pertaining to the rights of the child so the whole legal regime uh, ranging from uh, an international platform uh, to the national platform, we can you know we can see that in all the uh, respective angles, uh, we are making uh, you know possible solutions whenever any uh, particular uh, problem is there. Uh, we are there uh, at a legislative platform, uh, through the judicial platform, uh, through an administrative mechanism platform. At every platform, we are trying to uh, you know implement whatever is possible for the welfare of the child. Okay. And so, in this concern, uh, the social transformation that no, uh, we have started that uh, we consider that uh, the child is is nothing but it is the voice of the God or uh, the innocence at its best. And so, from that point, uh, then we have the violation of the rights of the children at a different platform, and then we have accordingly uh, the different regulations at an international platform and national platform. So all these things are nothing but a part and parcel of the uh, transformation which has been carried out at a legal and the social development uh, in the laws pertaining to the child. Okay. So uh, that's it for the day. Uh, I think uh, uh, is, uh, is, is this uh, for your third module. Uh, I'm not going to bore you anymore uh, by uh, bombarding you with the thoughts and the uh, case laws uh, and the uh, legal provisions you are the, the students of the masters and so uh, you, you are you are well versed with all the uh, provisions of the law and the case laws okay so just you need to have the interconnection of uh, those provisions pertaining to women and uh, children and you have to correlate it with the transformation that was carried out uh, uh, in a phase wise manner so ancient medieval modern uh, how we have uh, no, uh, no, we, we already have analyzed the situations and accordingly, uh, we have made the transformation. As per the transformation, we have made the transformation with the changes in the legal provisions. Okay, so that's it uh, for the day. Tomorrow, uh, we'll be going to discuss about the uh, modernization and the law. Okay, so uh, basically, uh, modernization as a value. Uh, we are going to focus upon the agrarian reforms, uh, specifically the industrialization. Uh, we are going to understand the reforms in the court process. That is also one of the important aspects, uh, specifically the criminal law and the civil law in that perspective. And the prison reforms is also one of the important part that uh, uh, tomorrow uh, we are going to discuss. Okay? At the same time, we are also going to discuss about the, uh, uh, no, the rights of the prisoners because uh, this is also one of the 
an uh, upcoming uh, issue that we are facing specifically the mental health of the prisoners uh, is, is the concern in this uh, in this respect okay and then uh, democratic decentralization uh, and the local self-government so that is the last one that tomorrow we are going to end up with okay uh, so if you have any doubt you can just unmute yourself and can ask uh, or you can just put it in the chat window uh, i'll just put uh, this video on for next one minute and then uh, i'll just uh, take a leave okay Thank you for your patient uh, hearing and uh, see you tomorrow uh, for uh, the modernization and the law. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, sir.